Harriet Holman hey. is now joining. Tracy? Yes, ma'am. Okay, just letting you know I'm on. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a minute, we're getting ready to start. Okay. Hold on just a minute. Okay. Okay. You've been muted. To unmute yourself, press star six. I want to go ahead and call the... Uh, Water and Sewer Committee to order. 
And we have one item to take up, and Mr. Hopper? You have 15 minutes, sir. I can do it in 13, sir. That's good. Yeah, we have a <coughs> I'd like to make the case for water and sewer increases in Dorchester County. One of the things that's been going oh, on minute. is that... No, we didn't have that public thing. Go ahead. Sir. Act, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. We've actually been reviewing our uh, revenues and expenses, and we're beginning to see our erosion in our margins. And let's kind of go historically. Our current water and wastewater rates and fees, current impact fees for wastewater has gone went from 400 to 2,600 in 2002. The current water impact fees of 690 uh, was set in 2006. The current connection fees for wastewater of 1,145 uh, set in 2006. Current water connection fees 2006. So in the past 12 years, water and wastewater rates have been only increased twice, once in 2008 and the other in 2015. Let's take a close look at the 2008 increase. BP Barber was your engineer at the time and did a water and rate study. And in the study, they indicated that both the existing rates and fees were too low. The county, as a result of that study, adopted the following. Took a minimum water rate, was increased from 1580 to 2375. Minimum sewer rate was increased from 3480 to 3790. The study, interestingly, recommended an impact fee of 1418 that this fee was not adopted. Current fee remain, remained at 690. Study also recommended a water, wastewater impact fee of 317 <clears throat> Our current fee is still 2600. Study recommended that the connection fee of 932 for a 33 quarter inch tap be in, instituted by 10, uh, 2010. Our current fee is 800. And the study also recommended that the connection fee for a four-inch tap by 2010 should be 1345. Our current fee is still at 1145. So if you take a close look, over 12 years ago, we were talking about increasing our rates and fees that are still that were higher then than they are now. So the next increase was happened in 2015. You approved increase, increase in water and wastewater rates, but no changes were made in the impact and connection fees. So what happened? The uh, wastewater rates changed from 30, 37.90 to 40 even, and the three quarter inch connection base fee went from 23.75 to 25.50. That 50 cents actually includes a uh, D hex. Now. What, what things are affecting our, our rates? One, since 2015, construction costs have uh, increased by at least 15%. It's actually higher here in the low country. Electrical costs have increased by 16%. Our water costs from Charleston Water has increased by 17% since 2015. Let's take a look at what's happened since 2015 to now. 2015, 77 employees, now we have and 96 authorized positions. 2015, 125 pump stations. Now we have 136. 2015, 8,500 water customers. In 2020, that's over 10,000. And in 2015, 24,500 sewer customers. Now we have over 30,000. Interesting about water and sewer, we don't really receive any uh, tax dollars for operations maintenance as an enterprise fund. All expenses must be covered by either rates, grants, and fees. All the capital projects, such as plant expansions, and pump station rehabilitations, are funded by those three sources. And just an interesting side note, <laughs> since 1995, <clears throat> Dorchester Water and Sewer has received about $8.8 .8 million in grants and $3.5 million in loans for infrastructure projects. I thought that was kind of interesting side bit. So, why the rate increases? Why am I asking for this? 90% of the water sold by uh, water and is purchased by Charleston County, which has a program increase for the foreseeable future. DHEC regulations are requiring uh, capital projects such as the elevated storage tank down at uh, Briarwood and also 
uh, treatment plan expansion so that we can actually maintain treatment capacities. In expenditures have been increasing due to increased electrical, chemical, personnel, and water purchase, <clears throat> purchases. And finally, our rate study is beginning to project revenue shortfalls in the current near future. Why do we have to do a rate, rate water and rate wastewater study? It's by ordinance. Um, this is section 44201, rate study, adoption of findings by the department. I'll just read a brief to you. County Council and or the department may commission a rate study to determine the adequacy of adopted fees and charges to provide or to cover the cost of services provided by the county. So what it is is that I am obligated as the director to take a look to see what the revenues are, what the expenses are, and see whether or not we are meeting our budget requirements. Interesting and that's contained in this uh, ordinance, I didn't know, but I know it tried that I could literally impose a rate increase myself, but it had to be improved by the council in 30 days. <laughs> that is not on my radar scope, never will even do that. So, so what happens is if you take a look at it, look at the rate study uh, to adequately provide and cover for county costs. We engaged uh, in, in, 19, in 2019, Hazen and Sawyer to do the rate study. And as the results of that study were presented to council uh, during December 13, 2019. You probably remember that it was uh, hours and hours of presentation. So, we talked about the scope. One of the things they did do for us is develop a model that we can actually model our finances based uh, dynamically so that if we can see increases from Charleston water or from uh, expenses, we can track that to see exactly how our revenues and fees are covering those expenses. Mm -hmm. They looked at uh, rec recommended award and rates for increases uh, for on a 15-year time span. We're only going to look at a, a five-year time span because that's actually within the, the time frame <coughs> that we look at the water and rates for increases. So you wonder where we were standing before we started talking about increases. We, they actually benchmark. If you look, our uh, water benchmark rates in FY19, which is also the same 20, that uh, Dorchester County falls toward the end of, uh, to the right of the curve, as we say, uh, for uh, rates. So, what are we looking at in terms of rates? This is a sample bill that we have prepared based on the, uh, the rates. Um, Left-hand side looks at where we are now. Right-hand side shows where we will be. If you notice that, um, the average bill will go from 3180 uh, for a water uh, bill to uh, 3509 in the proposed rate increase. If you're a commercial using a windage meter, uh, your rate will go based on that's based on 18,000 gallons. <coughs> your total bill will be 9461 and on our current rate, and it would increase to um, $104.51 in terms of uh, FY21, if you adopt that increase. Wonder where we stand in sewer? This picture takes a close look. Again, we're on the right hand side. There are very few people who are cheaper than us. Seabrook Island and the sound town of Somerton, Somerville. CPW has a small service area. They have no debt. And that's the reason the Harriet Hallman. rates so low. So, what does the water bill look like? Is now exiting. What would the uh, sewer bill look like? Currently, a uh, flat rate uh, is uh, forty dollars. Our new proposed scenario be forty-four eighty. If you're a commercial user using forty-three thousand gallons, that's actually one of the average users. Uh, it will move from thirty-three thousand three hundred thirty-eight dollars forty-four cents to three hundred seventy-eight dollars and eighty-eight cents. So. That's Interesting impact. So, Mr. Harper. Yes, sir. Are we okay, are we okay Mr. Harriet Harper? Harriet Hallman is okay. now joining. Okay. Yes, sir. I feel like feel like I'm on 2001, the Space Odyssey. How? <laughs> so, um, yes, can you go back a couple of slides, please? Sure. I want to look at a couple of things. Um, first, nope, nope. Go back to your chart. Thank you. So, there. Yeah, there's Somerville CPW on the water side. Go to the next bill okay. or the next table. 
Yeah. All right, so, you know, here on the water bill, you know, 18,000 gallons of usage, what, what type of uh, commercial business would that be? Just retail, That's restaurant? More, um, more, to, more so of a retail, sir. It, it's really based on how, well, what we did is that we looked at um, the usages of uh, the various categories, one inch meters, one and a half inch meters, and pick what's, what the average usage was going through that, that particular meter. Normally, those one inch meters are a commercial use um, and that's where the 18,000 comes from, this average consumption through a one inch meter that the commercial users were using. We did not actually identify specifically what that business was. Okay. I was just curious, I mean, would it, um, I can get would it be difficult question. to get a couple of different examples of a retail, a restaurant, and then, you know, what in one of our industries would be using so that we could just sort of see how that actually Certainly applies so. to them specifically? And then uh, two slides further down, or the next one, all right, so Somerville is the cheapest here. So I see Somerville CPW, which of course has a small footprint, um, is $24, and then we're at $40. Would that also be because Somerville CPW pretty much refuses to treat industrial wastewater and we're having to do all of that for them? Uh, there is, their rate does reflect that they don't do industrial pretreatment. So they do not do industrial pretreatment at Somerville CPW. So therefore their, their sewer rates are cheaper because they're not having to do that heavy lift that the county is having to do. Would they that be have, reasonable? That is reasonable. They okay. don't have a uh, pretreatment program <clears throat> they're having to pay for. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Any other questions? I have a couple of questions. First of all, I believe also Somerville CPW does not have any debt. Zero debt. Zero debt. That's another reason they have such lower. I want to go back to something you and I have talked about. Um, and Mr. Ward and I were here when this discussion started back in 2003, when we invested uh, in the Lake Marion Water Authority, and that is now being realized to bring water into our county. And maybe I was under the, the mistaken belief that the whole county would benefit from Lake Marion Water, but as it stands now, it sounds it's going primarily to the upper county and most of the people, 90% of the people in my council district um, uh, pay for Charleston water through us. Mm -hmm. And they are getting ripped off, and they know that. And two of their councilmen recently asked me, well, what happened to this Lake Marion water? You guys kept telling us we were going to benefit from that. And I guess now we're, they're not going to benefit. Is that correct? Uh, I was going to say, let's, let's start with the beginning in, in terms of Lake Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorchester County entered into a uh, long-term agreement with Charleston County. Uh, that agreement is 50 years. Right. Um, so any of the areas such as uh, Westcott Plantation, uh, eastern part of our- Harriet Home. Area, mm -hmm. is, locked, is now exiting. It's locked down for 50 years before we can uh, bring the Lake Mary water in. What I have been doing though, is that trying to make sure that we put in the backbone infrastructure to serve all the areas that technically is not served by uh, Charleston Water where we're in that long-term contract with an eye on when that contract expires, I probably will not be here, but we will have that option to serve those areas also. But it's uh, a long time <coughs> coming. Mr. Ward, if you care. Yeah, other thing I wanted to uh, bring out, Mr. Hargett, a couple of years ago, in the uh, process for trying to reestablish what that agreement would be with Charleston Water System. We got a release of service territory uh, along Highway 61 and 165. So previously that area was also covered by the agreement. So we got a release of service territory so that that area could be served by the county. And as a result of that, that does give us the ability to serve a greater area with Lake Marion water in the future. So. Um, having that opportunity does not resolve the issue that you asked about mm -hmm. along Dorchester Road. I, too, am a customer <laughs> and your constituent in that regard and paying the rates as they um, are affected uh, through Charleston Water System, uh, through the Water and Sewer Department of the county. <clears throat> However, um, what we have done, and I thought this was also something Mr. Harper was going to mention, in order to reduce those rates, we put up additional elevated storage. Mm -hmm. um, on Old Glory behind 
um, the shopping center that fronts along Dorchester at the corner of Westcott. Mm -hmm. So those measures that we can put in place to deal with our issues of peak usage, we've done those things to negotiate lower rates. One other question is, does Charleston Water uh, pull most of their water for our area out of the Edisto River? Uh, yes, sir. Through the tunnel? Through the tunnel. So our water comes from the Edisto uh, River. It, it actually it rolls right past us on the way into uh, Hanahan. That's very interesting. Thank you. Another good thing, Mr. Hargett, that the Lake Mayan Regional Water is doing <laughs> and is that we're getting a fire hydrant all along that line that we didn't have before, which mm -hmm. if, if it's, if it's kind of comical today. A while ago, Mr. Uh, Chief came up to you and said, well, I see you're going to test the fire hydrants. Yep. And that's helped the uh, rural community get their I agree. necessary fire rate that they got. It's uh, the, the Lake Marion, if I may, Lake Marion water system will have a profound effect on Dorchester County. As you probably realize, especially the, the western part of our county, is a desert in terms of water. That's the one key that has, that has been missing to allow development to occur there. The Romans had the expression, aqua vita est, it's water is life. And the fact that we didn't have water there, we're not able, we're not able to bring industry, we're not able to, to grow even the residential side, but now that we have that line there, now that there's water available, now that we have elevated storage at, at Ridgeville, soon to have um, elevated storage at Winding Woods, which will allow us to wheel water as far as Reedsville. That's exciting times, and that's the impact that Lake Marion water will have on our county. That's wonderful, and I, my last question, will the new customers in the western part of the county and industry pay the same water bit rate that, that the lower county will pay? We have a unified water rate. So if you're in Dorchester County, you will pay the same rates. All right. Thank you. Yeah, my rates are going up. Thank you. <laughs> it's the least I could do, sir. Any other questions? M Mr. Oh, yeah. j j just a real quick statement, and, and, and no pun intended. Well, maybe there is a pun intended, but a rising tide lifts all boats. <laughs> there you go. I like that. Yes. Any other questions? Gentlemen, the reason we didn't do a public hearing Today, we have to do it on third read because we have no public here. Let's explain that. You finished, Mr. Harper? Yes, sir. Well, yes, sir. is there a motion on the floor? So moved. Second. A motion and a second in discussion. We've already had it. All in favor? This is second reading. Second reading. That's correct. All in favor? Ms. Harmon? She's gone? Six to nothing. Mr. Harper, thank you so much, sir. You're welcome, sir. Good job. Go ahead and have some motion. Okay. Go ahead, Mayor. Motion be adjourned. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bye. I just want to be all in favor. We adjourn, and we'll go right into our regular meeting. Hope we can expedite this. Sorry. Wait, sir. Wait. Unknown participant is now joining. Mario, can you hear us?
Yes, I can. You can't do no voting now. Just listen. You got to have it yet? So I'm probably hearing snoring at the end. We'll make up the time in public comments. <laughs> True. I like this place. Can I go make some comments just to make you feel? I'm going to go and stop. Enjoy this way. They practice what? Um, seasons off, it looks like. Wow. Yeah, so, um, Operating and so either a somebody exposes us or somebody in my office gets it at that point. We're working from home, and I don't know, it's fun. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to call the Dorchester County Council meeting of March the 16th, 2020 to order. And I would ask that everybody please stand and ask Mr. Hargett again to give the invocation of Pledge of Allegiance. Lord, we pause again to give you thanks for this day and for the blessings you give us. And we ask that you be with us in this meeting, the very important meeting tonight. And may every decision we make be according to your will and your purpose. And Please be with all those men and women around the world who defend our freedoms and our liberty and smile upon them. And we pray again for all those folks that are involved with this coronavirus. And would you look it down upon them and give your blessings and your healing to them today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll request the address council. Here no public, uh, no public people here. We'll skip over that. The adoption of minutes for March 2000, uh, March 2, 2020, County Council meeting. So moved. Second. Motion on floor and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Six. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Before we get into the meet this meeting, if, if, if I might, I've got a motion to amend the agenda. I want to try to get it. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would move that County Council amend its agenda to take up the issue of a declaration of a state of emergency due to the probable impacts and effects of the coronavirus COVID-19. There's a motion to flow. We have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Six. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion as well. Mr. Chairman, I would move that County Council adopt the declaration of a state of emergency for Dorchester County due to the probable impacts and effects of COVID-19 virus as outlined in the declaration provided to County Council. Second. Second. There's a motion on the floor and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Six Thanks, sir. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Next item is adoption of Pro Proclamation 10, uh, sorry, 2001, proclaiming April 2020 child abuse 
Prevention Month in Dorchester County. Uh, our secretary had talked to Ms. K and she unfortunately could not make it. And we'll, if you don't mind, we'll just present this to her at a later date. Is that all right? Yes. Is the motion on the Harriet Hallman is now joining. All right, we talked about a proclamation for uh, child abuse uh, prevention month. All so, in favor? So, so, so moved. Second. Okay. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Harriet? Ms. Harriet? Ms. Harry, are you there? Okay. 3D, second read of ordinance to supplement the code of ordinance, ordinances of Dorchester County, South Carolina by adding section, a new section, chapter four, animals prohibiting a pet store, a here and after defined in a dog or cat. 2020 puppy mail ordinance. And I think we all pretty well know what this is. Have we had a chance to read it? Go ahead and say a motion. So moved. Second. And the motion on floor and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. All right. So Mr. If I might add one, one thing real quick here. I, I, I appreciate everybody's support for this. I did want to make a, a, a real quick comment here. Um, and, and I want this to move forward. I hope you'll support it. Um, I have actually been in contact with the owner of um, the pet land here, which is sort of the... The, where this thing started, um, have not only spoken to him, but um, spoken to a couple of folks um, that I, I, I guess for lack of a better term, I'd call some of his lobbyists um, and, and had good conversations with them, understand their points, their directions. In addition to this, um, unfortunately at this time, because of, of this virus going around, um, I've done some of my own research and I've looked in some opportunities. I've, I've spoken with um, Mr. Frampton earlier today. Again, I, I would like to see this passed. Um, but I think we still have some opportunity to look at this with some possibilities to not just cut everything off and say no way, no how, but to actually require to, to put a, a bar <clears throat> in place that says, if you meet this level of, um, if your breeders meet this level of, of animal care, animal welfare, then we'll, we'll consider that. And, and if you don't, then we'll follow through with this ordinance. But I'd like to, that opportunity, <clears throat> just the consideration that this is not I want to make sure everybody understands that this is important to me, no question. Um, but I also understand, as you've always said, sit down and talk and, and come up with some reasons. You know, bans, prohibitions always have other challenges. Um, I want everybody to know I'm not just, this is not just a somebody said it, let's do it. I'm continuing to work on this in, in my own time. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, if you've got anything at the third read, you know, if you want to amend it, you can sure do that. Let yes, me sir. tell you. That. Believe it or not, I've had a lot of calls on this. I haven't had a negative call pertaining to this proposal ordinance we're going to do. I got a lot of compliments on it. David, I thank you for uh, ramrod Yes, sir. Any other discussion? I have a question, Mr. Shinnis, uh, in regards to this. What is your definition of a rescue dog that came up to me from one of my people? Uh, well, the, the ordinance What itself, is a rescue dog? The res ordinance itself, actually, I think the point it uses, doesn't it does says... The, Rescue organizations, and that's what I wanted to clarify. It talks about rescue organizations. So rescue organizations, I'm not sure even in South Carolina that they're officially recognized. Some states have recognitions. I'm actually a volunteer for Boykin Spaniel Rescue. That should surprise no one. Um, we are recognized in the state of South Carolina, at least when I, um, I, I've, I, I've called our animal control folks and they've helped me pull a dog out of, out of the um, pound and it became a rescue but never heard that term I didn't it, it is typically breed specific and you know a a, a lab or a, a golden or something like that goes in the um, the rescue folks are always paying attention to okay. um thank you shelters and we try to pull them out and try to if they're unhealthy quite honestly in in a lot of cases the rescue organization puts the entire bill to bring that animal back to health and they place it with an adoptee a foster or something like that depending we've got dogs that are what we call permanent foster they will always be in someone else's care they'll never be adopted they never be so. sold in a store like they'll this. never well in rescue organizations we don't we have a a fairly in-depth um application process with Boykin Spaniel Rescue they may go into a pet store with some of their rescue animals but they're, those folks are still going to have to fill out applications typically to be able to adopt that rescue dog. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? 
Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if I may, Mr. Chen, it's just a quick uh, point. Um, when you're talking about as far as the mandates and uh, information that would be required, would that be something that we set in place as far as um, it's, um, parameters? One, I, so it certainly could be. I think in the case of this, and I would encourage anybody to, if they want to look, right now there is a system in place um, and it's canine, as in the dog, not right. not canine, but a thing called Canine Cares, which was developed by <coughs> Purdue University. And they have created what in effect is an audit by a third party independent auditor goes into these breeding facilities and they meet a series of what I will call pretty stiff criteria. Uh, it includes something as simple as, we, we all think it's simple unless you've raised dogs, but socialization is is hugely important in, in an animal. Right. Um, pit bulls aren't bad dogs. It's they have poor socialization because of right. humans. So the um, w when you look at something like that, these things require socialization in these mass breeders. Well, quite frankly, I don't know that they can meet that. Maybe they can, right. but if we could put this in place and allow someone to, again, make a living doing this, but it's a pretty high standard. Uh, and, and Purdue University is a well-known veterinary medicine school. They've got all kinds of things that most of us would, a lot of us would think kind of strange in the, in the work they do with animals and animal welfare and, and socialization skills and breeding and stuff like that. But um, to give you an idea, this thing has been in place for a few years and I think only 24 breeders um, in the nation have actually completed this canine care certification. But, so it's a high bar, no right. question. So as we're help with the process as far as giving them the guidelines. Just thinking down the road, if that were to come in play, Correct. Okay, very correct. Yeah, that's Are you awesome. talking Thank about you. things, Mr. Chinnis, like, um, I mean, are you limiting the number of litters that um, a particular breed can have, as well as, you know, not going every six months and it, just running it, that, that it, it, It's an entire animal welfare process. Okay, it's, good. It's pretty elaborate. And again, this is coming from a veterinarian school that's developed this, um, and I'm going to pronounce the, the professor's name, I think it's Crony or Coney or something like that. And um. It's, I, I, I wanted to talk to them to make sure that I understood that it's, the, the bar is as high as I think it is. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you, Mr. Parker swore up and down to me that he, you know, put a bar in place. He, he you know, and again, his, he is, let's be very clear, he is in the county, but he's under the, the jurisdiction of the town of Somerville. But if he ever chose to move into the county, he'd be subject to our ordinances at this point in time. And this would require him to do this. He seems to think, that, you know, well, I haven't talked to him specifically about canine cares, but I will tell you guys, he sent me a, a list of about a half a dozen um, certificates from animal, there's a registry called OFA, um, and he sent me their certificates. Well, the challenge is seven certificates doesn't account for the number of dogs that he's got in kennels today. So that's a very, very small, he, he's, he's not even scratching the surface in what I would think he would need to do to, you know, to convince me that He's, his puppies are being raised um, in a manner that we would expect puppies to be raised. So, again, thanks for the question. Sure. Is there anything in that particular uh, guidance that would say if you're buying a pure breed puppy for $600 per puppy and turning around and selling it for $5,000 that we're there's going probably to look at that? The, the gouging portion of that, and I don't know any other way to call that, the gouging portion of that is not. Um, that I can tell in there. Um, the only thing you can be assured of is if they've passed this audit, they've, they've done quite a bit. Jay, you know as well as I do, and I, 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 my, my puppies, when I bred and raised puppies like you do, you are no longer they raise muted. the house, mm -hmm. and we don't get anywhere close to what they're getting for these dogs that are raised in no. chicken coops for all intents and purposes. Right. So. Any other questions? Gentlemen, we're giving a second reading tonight. Mr. Crosby, if you've got some issues, maybe you and David can get together prior to third reading. Any other questions? Hey, no more questions. All in favor? Harriet, you still with us? Uh, that's six to nothing. Any correspondence, Mr. Uh, <coughs> Board? Mr. Chairman and Council, all items have been provided at time of receipt. Thank you, sir. For a Mr. Daniel Prentice, Dorchester County Deputy <coughs> Administrator, CFO, recognition of staff for receiving the GFOA Distinguished Budget Presentation Award for the physical year 2020 budget, excuse me, budget document, physical year 2020 Distinguished Budget Presentation Award.
All right, well, the staff that I'd like to recognize this evening is here with us in spirit. Um, they wanted to be here, but obviously given the circumstances when given the opportunity to not be here, they took that opportunity. Um, but just briefly, uh, we were awarded for the 14th time consecutive years, the GFOA budget award for the fiscal year 2020 budget. And I wanted to make a couple of notes about that. Um, as you know, Jessica has been involved in the preparation of that document for a number of years. And I went back and asked her and she said she's been preparing it since fiscal year 2012. Uh, this fiscal year, for the first time, it was prepared wholly by Melanie Hay. Um, so this is the first year that she hasn't had her hand in that process. And I think it just really speaks to, you know, that handover of responsibilities and the institutional knowledge that's been passed along. Uh, Melanie has been with us since January of 2017. Uh, she was actually the first person that I recommended to hire after I came to the county when we had that vacancy. And I'm um, proud that she's picked up the budget officer responsibilities and, uh, you know, look forward to having her on our staff. She does a great job with that document, with our revenue manual, uh, and a number of other pieces of the budget process. So uh, you'll be seeing her at our, our budget retreat. I assume that to be in April, since this week's is going to be canceled. Um, but I want to thank her for her work. And hopefully at a future council meeting, we can take some time to take a photo and recognize her. But um, we'll get that out now. Thank so. you, sir. Uh, Mr. Daniel, we, you might as well go into the presentation of February 2020 monthly budget report. All right. Harriet Hallman is now exiting. So this is the budget report for February. Um, we're one month left. We're in the last month of the third quarter of the fiscal year. Um, budget for the general fund this year is $62.1 million. Uh, we've raised $45.5 million in revenue. Uh, that represents 80.1% of property taxes. And of course, today is the rollover date for delinquents. So we anticipate that next month we'll have posted most of the property taxes. Uh, I can see on the back end from build assessments that we're running between 95 and 96% collections right now. Um, on the expenditure side, we're at 38.8 million, uh, running under budget on that end. And don't believe there's any notes to provide to you there. Um, on the capital fund, revenue of 6.3 million, uh, total revenue collected so far to date of 3.9 million. And then of course that use of fund balance on the fourth line of 1.5 million is consistent of carryovers uh, that were completed back in September, and then also the fund balance that you authorized us to use at the last meeting for the Harleyville Fire Station. Um, on the expenditure side, we're at 2.7 million. Majority of our vehicles have been received for this fiscal year. Uh, we're starting to try to close some of those things out so that we don't have as much carry over, carryover um, year over year. In the fire fund, uh, total budget of 8.1 million, uh, revenue of 6.1 million. Uh, you'll note the other financing sources there, uh, we've done some transfers in from the general fund. Uh, that $930,000 supports the tanker truck that was purchased uh, back late last year. And then the, one of the six engines uh, that we've ordered to replace engines throughout the lower part of the county, as well as the um, North Charleston contract district engine that we had pledged to replace for them through the contract. Those will be received between May all the way through November as they're built. And then on the expenditure side, uh, 5.2 million uh, in expenditures so far to date, and they're right there below budget as well. On the enterprise funds, water and sewer, uh, total budget of 33 million, uh, revenues to date of 20 million. I will note that there were some credit card processing um, transactions that were not posted from the prior period, and the treasurer's office is working with staff to get those allocated and reconciled. Uh, so those will post in one batch this month. And then on the expense side, 22.6 million. Um, of course, a lot of that has to do with construction. If you note that last line, uh, 5.7 million is uh, related to construction capital projects. So it uh, doesn't necessarily correlate with the percentage. So they're running under budget on all other categories. Stormwater, $3.6 million budget, $2.3 million in revenues. Of course, most of those come in on property tax bills and then expenses of 1.9 million. And lastly, in solid waste, um, budget of 8.5 million, uh, revenue to date of 5.8 million, and expenses of 4.6 million. If you will give me a little bit extra time, I would like to point your attention to the vertical construction capital projects report that we've included. Um, it would be right following the cash report and the detention center food report. Um, I'd like to go through each of those capital projects just to give recognition to the fact that with Rebecca Dantzler and her new role as the capital projects manager, we're gonna to begin to include this for you monthly. 
Uh, we're working on a comprehensive report uh, through SharePoint. We're working to develop uh, SharePoint to provide us with a capital projects management application, which will then provide just a PDF that will generate uh, every council meeting to give you an update on all capital projects. Uh, the first on this list is Ashley River Park. Today was the deadline for bids. However, we received correspondence from contractors indicating that some of their subs and estimators were non-responsive on providing bids. So we have bumped that back just one week. Um, and so we'll have the uh, bids received a week from today and anticipate still having some time to give them a chance to get their bids submitted for Davis Bailey Park on the 31st. So that has not changed on Davis Bailey, just pushing back one week on Ashley River given the circumstances that are going on at the moment. Um, alcohol and Drug Commission relocation. Uh, you approved the lease and the facilities use agreement and the recognition of revenue at the last council meeting. Uh, the facilities use agreement has been executed by both the Alcohol and Drug Commission and uh, the county, and then we're just waiting to receive the final lease. Uh, we have a construction contract prepared for the landlord to execute, and we anticipate that we'll be able to get that agency moved by the end of July based upon the final design and construction timelines. Uh, Dorchester Paul's, we have completed contract documents, and those have been executed by both parties, uh, awarded to MBCon for a design build project. Uh, that is a new type of delivery method for us. We previously engaged the design bid build process and the design build allows us to procure both the architect and the contractor. Um, so MBCon provides the construction services and then they have an internal design firm called Boomerang. Uh, so they'll go through the process to design this. Uh, we'll agree on a guaranteed maximum price at some point down the road once we get design partially completed and then a uh, contract will be awarded once the funds from Dorchester Paul is coupled with the funds authorized by the county are in place. Uh, of course, we purchased the property on Sandridge Road uh, for the Dorchester Fire uh, Station 17. So we're going to be posting an uh, invitation to bid. Uh, we were planning on doing it late last week. We're gonna post that this week if time allows. Uh, and that's for construction of a steel frame building, single bay fire station. And we're looking to possibly fund that with some DHEC money uh, based upon uh, possibly relocating some of our pod services um, for emergency events that are currently being stored on Deming Way up to that location. Uh, former detention center demolition uh, fence was uh, post put up last week and permits were received from the town and SCDOT and that demolition is proceeding at this point. Uh, they're doing an interior gut and salvage of the metal and things that are in that building that they felt were worthwhile for them to remove. Uh, of course, we talked about Harleyville at the last meeting and uh, based upon that recommendation and approval from council, uh, we proceeded with a construction contract and so they have 245 days from award to complete that project as far as the uh, construction of the new crew quarters and demolition of the old crew quarters. Flip to the next page, uh, human services building renovation and the law enforcement complex renovation. With this particular building, after alcohol and drug moves out, we will present some schematics and a scope of work uh, to create an office space for business, excuse me, for building services, community services, and uh, planning to move from their current quarters over to the area where alcohol and drug previously was located. And then with the law enforcement complex, um, based upon the trailers that will no longer be needed once we get dispatch and the emergency operations center out of that building, uh, we'll do a renovation of that and the jail annex that used to be used prior to the new detention center. And we believe that we'll be able to put all of the trailer capacity back into the building uh, and eliminate the trailers. Uh, the new EOC, one of our major projects right now is getting those trailers relocated from 212 Deming Way over to the Carter property next to EMS headquarters on West 5th North. And uh, right now they're putting up the fence, running underground conduit, water and sewer, and preparing the pads. Uh, we're planning to put those trailers on the ground at that location on April 13th. And then once that's completed, we'll be able to clear that land um, behind the EOC on Deming Way for a groundbreaking later this summer for the new EOC. And before we move any further with that as far as bidding or a construction contract, we will present um, schematics and all the conceptual uh, to county council for review and approval. Um, the new tax system, we have implemented the boats module, which is phase one of the project. So boats are being built through the new tax system. Phase two, uh, coming up later this year and into next will be vehicles. Of course, those are handled on a six month basis with um, January through June and July through December. And then the phase three will be uh, real property as well as delinquent. And so that project will wrap up sometime late next year. Um, and that'll eliminate our AS400 system. We're currently running within budget on that, which is great because the funds were approved for that project back in FY15. And so there's not really been any inflation on the technology side uh, as far as needing additional funds for the software design and the peripheral that we'll need to install. 
Oak Brook TIF Soccer Club, uh, working with Land Plan Group South, revising the master plan based upon some initial cost estimates, and uh, hope to bring that back to you soon for review. Uh, the earliest we'd be able to proceed with that project would be the fall of 2020 based upon uh, scheduling the wetlands mitigation um, as far as anything that's considered there. Um, and we also don't want to in, uh, interrupt their primary season. Oak Brook TIF streetscaping, that's under design, but that is going to require that DOT complete their safety project on Dorchester Road. So that will uh, hang back until that gets completed. Uh, Ridgeville Library, we're preparing uh, RFQ documents to hire a design bid build um, kind of process as far as hiring the architect. And then we'll let that move forward once uh, council has worked with the library board to identify property. Um, Summers Corner Fire and EMS, same situation. Based upon the construction activity out there and the developer contribution that's pledged, we're going to go ahead and complete uh, design documents and look at uh, what the probable cost of construction would be and then bring council a uh, further recommendation uh, to move forward with that project. Uh, Texas Community Park, we're just waiting on contract documents from TUPCO and we hope to have most of that project completed going into May when we're required to have all of the 2010 bond proceeds uh, expended. And then lastly, the Trident Tech Campus. Um, this is a little bit dated, but I did meet with Robert Pratt and Chris Karpus last week uh, about the design. We've given Trident Tech a deadline of March 31st to submit any final comments on the plans. Uh, their contractors are currently doing their estimates for Mr. Pratt at this time and going through that process. And then once we have the bottom line on construction costs, we'll bring back a recommendation um, based upon the funding that we have available. The hope is to get that project completed by the end of the year so that they can open uh, for spring semester in 2021. But happy to answer any questions. I just wanted to run through those uh, comprehensively since I haven't had a chance to do that uh, all under one roof before. And I'll continue to provide this report, but not necessarily go through it in any uh, additional detail unless there's questions. Any questions? All right. Job, Daniel. A lot, go lot going on. A lot going on. A lot going on. I'm thankful to have some staff support, so I appreciate that extra position. Uh, Rebecca is still uh, getting settled into her role. Uh, we have extended an offer to a purchasing services manager uh, to take her spot, and until that transition happens, she'll kind of be uh, straddling both uh, positions, but that, that's going well. Harriet Hallman is um, now joining. If you'll indulge me, I do have one additional item uh, regarding the coronavirus um, with regards to credit card processing fees. What I'd like to do is request that County Council consider one last amendment to the agenda uh, to authorize staff to waive all of our credit card processing fees to try to encourage a greater adoption of online service utilization. I've talked to the County Treasurer and uh, we've worked with uh, Missy Hopkins and her group as well as uh, Water and Sewer to figure out what we need to do for each of those. So the authorization um, would be to uh, waive credit card processing fees through the end of the month my estimate based upon utilization and an increase, of course, for waiving the fees is about $100,000 uh, across the board, which could come from our disaster fund. Uh, the systems that this would work for would be the tax system, which handles all vehicles, boats, and real property. Um, it would work for Evolve, which handles business license, hospitality, all your uh, permitting, uh, building permits, uh, plan reviews, land disturbance, those type things, and then water and sewer if people call into the office where a fee is now charged. So all of those would be waived uh, through March 31st. So moved. Second. Second. And that's and discussion on that. Wait a minute. Would that be to amend the agenda? Make motion. One of us got to make the motion. Whoops. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Got ahead of myself. Pretty good, rookie. Thank you. Withdraw the motion. <laughs> I'll make a motion to amend the agenda. There we go. You have a second. Second. All in favor? Now, do I have the necessary motion? Okay. I think I'll try it one more time. It's so moved. <laughs> yes. Second. second. There's a motion of Florida second. All in favor? Thank you again, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Ward. Glad to see you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ward, sir. Mr. Ward, or Mr. Chairman, before, before we go into Fire, this, sir. yes, sir, I'm sorry to do this, but um, I've got a thought that I want to just run by somebody. And before we go into this agenda item, could we take about a five minute recess? I want to ask some questions before we jump into this next item. Absolutely. Is that, is that okay? That's, you want to take a five minute break? If that's all right. We'll take a five minute break. All right. Thank Cheers. you, sir. Cheers. Recognize five minute break. <clears throat>
You've been muted. You are no longer muted. <laughs> Actually, Eddie was showing Jay what it looks like to have it. I stand correct. Arts I think Mr. Ward. Thank you. Mr. Ward. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Council, if, if I can, um, uh, take this opportunity to provide some information to the public relative to the declaration and actions that have been uh, taken by Council staff. Uh, within the declaration itself um, that County Council adopted earlier, uh, pursuant to the Dorchester County Emergency Preparedness Ordinance number 0801, um, what we're looking to do is to have this state of emergency through April 13, 2020, unless sooner terminated. Um, several actions have been taken relative to trying to keep the public safe, um, trying to keep our public safety and first responders safe, as well as our employees, uh, not the least of which is the action that council just took uh, to waive fees to encourage the public to make payments online uh, versus coming to county buildings. Uh, the county has elected to close um, the lobbies and go to operation condition two. When I say the lobbies, uh, buildings will be closed to the public, so the public will have to interface online. We're doing that to try to minimize exposure. Um, obviously, the president earlier today indicated um, that based upon the advice of his staff, uh, providing additional guidance, trying to stop uh, gatherings of 10 people or more uh, in a preponderance of caution. That is down from the guidance from CDC of 50 people. Uh, what we're trying to make sure we're able to do uh, is really kind of twofold. We want to be able to continue to carry out our mission. Um, we feel the best way that we can do that is to be available to the public while still um, following the guidance in terms of uh, make, making sure we have social distancing. So. Um, with respect to the actual uh, powers being conveyed, I do want to uh, lay any fears, and this will be on the county's website. We'll use available resources of the county as reasonably necessary to cope with this situation. Um, we will work together and already have been working together uh, with our department heads and elected and appointed officials to address uh, concerns as they arise. Um, most of all, um, we are making sure that we have the necessary personnel protective equipment so our public safety officials and our first responders uh, will be able to respond and maintain their health. Uh, we're very concerned about um, the same things that the general public is concerned about. With the closure of the schools, many people have school-aged children, and we want to, to the best of our abilities, make sure um, that folks have the necessary child care in place uh, so they can continue to uh, move forward with their primary missions. Um, we are uh, and have been in the process of suspending non-emergency activities within the county and um, as necessary we will continue to prohibit public assemblies which is one of the reasons why um, in consultation with the chairman we elected to not have the public present in this meeting. So those steps are uh, being taken so that we can move forward. Additionally, Mr. Chairman and Council, if you will, I would also like to provide a little bit of additional information as was provided to council uh, earlier. Uh, and I'll read this uh, very quickly. So based upon the intelligence collected and recommendations of public health officials, including the CDC, Dorchester County has enhanced its preventative measures to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, therefore, the Human Services Building here in Somerville, the Kenneth F. Wagner Services Building in St. George, the Dorchester County Law Enforcement Complex located off of Deming Way, as well as the Dorchester County Water and Sewer Building, and finally the Public Works Building located within the community of Dorchester will be closed to the general public. <clears throat> and uh, we are providing alternative methods for obtaining information, for paying bills, and for access to other county services. Uh, this closing did take effect at 6 p.m. And again, we'll continue uh, through the 13th, unless otherwise canceled by action of council. Um, additionally, we have put a protocol in place 
uh, for dispatch, uh, whereby dispatch will be doing screenings for folks that are concerned about having the virus. Therefore, uh, with that protocol, we will be limiting the exposure of our first responders. Uh, our EMS personnel will be outfitted with the necessary uh, masks, uh, the N95 compliant masks, so that they will be able to respond and then also minimize risk to them so that we can have the necessary personnel healthy to continue to respond throughout this situation. Um, if it becomes required, uh, we are in a position whereby we'll be able to continue to correspond with the State Emergency Management Division. Uh, we'll be continuing to coordinate with the governor's office. Um, if in case of any uh, incidents that are reported where the uh, positives for the coronavirus are confirmed within the county, uh, we will not be able to disclose the names and locations, but that information will be disclosed to the public uh, through our public information officer. So uh, with that information in, in, in place and the protocols that we have in place, uh, we feel like we're in a better posture to be able to support the public. Uh, we hope that this allays any fears that the public has um, because we are now in the position that we feel um, will best allow us to uh, maintain uh, our operational capabilities throughout this incident. Mr. Ward, just to ask this clarifying question, this is, and it's funny, this actually was asking me as I was walking out the door the, to head here. So relative, for example, and this, this hits my day job, the Register of Deeds Office, the Register of Deeds Office, while it will remain open in terms of they'll have employees there to record a uh, file document. Yes, sir. But what about the records room? So we are not going to allow access to the records room. If there are requests uh, for records, uh, we will have employees that are there in the office that can reply to those requests. Yeah. Uh, and again, we are doing this, um, Mr. Hearn, and I didn't go into this, but I will go into this. Yes, sir. Uh, with respect to our protocols. Yes, sir. And I'll run through this. If, in fact, an employee while at work or after leaving work indicates that he or she is uh, exhibiting the positive signs of having the virus, they will, of course, follow the protocol through telemedicine uh, with subsequent referral to medical authorities to be tested. The unfortunate reality of that is the disease, uh, even when they're tested, the results may not come back for five to 14 days. So in that case, at that point, what we'll be doing is shutting down said office then we will have a private contractor come in and clean that office, mm -hmm. and that office will be quarantined. Mm -hmm. Those employees will be sent home to telecommute so we can continue um, electronically to have them work. So we are taking this very seriously, and that is one of the unfortunate realities of why we're asking the public not to come in the buildings so that we can actually try to keep the maximum amount of staff available, realizing that a lot of people would have been coming into the records room are coming in to look at a property records card in the assessor's office, and even coming in to have plans reviewed. So the fact of the matter is because we now have the capabilities to do many of these things electronically, this is allowing us to provide safety both to the general public by not exposing them as well as our employees. Yes, sir. And just, just to tell you and prove I'm not a hypocrite, we've locked our doors today too. We, there's a sign on our door that says, Call us. We'll try to accommodate you, but we're not allowing people to walk into our, my little office. So I get that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let me add what, what you just said, Jason. The USDA offices, as of uh, noon, they did the same thing. There's a, on the door, they shut their, their no, nobody goes in the offices, yeah. and they do it by either on the computer or by telephone. So, yes, sir. Mr. Bailey, can you call my mother and have tell her and my grandmother that they shouldn't go out? I might tell your mother, but I'm damn sure not going to tell your grandmother. You mean look? At it's not working for me, so. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. I, uh, Mr. Ward, I did not, re I did not hear the end date of this. What is the end date? That will be Monday, April 13. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ward, if, or Mr. Chairman, if I may, just a couple of things, um, and I appreciate the, the brief uh, for obviously the council and uh, Dorchester County community as a whole. Um, can you speak to any um, 
particulars as far as the civic side. Obviously, the medical, they're doing their, their piece as far as specifically fire, police, water sewer, as far as their mitigation plans and their directors reporting to you in order to proceed and, and make sure that, again, the community is assured, safe, and the plan moving forward should we have to do some type of community overlay in the event of an outbreak, as you just described. So, so the single biggest thing that uh, we became keenly aware of is the um, lack of availability uh, through our traditional sources for personal protective equipment. And that personal protective equipment is the equipment that the CDC has specifically said must be utilized by folks so that they can protect themselves when they're in close proximity to other people. Mm -hmm. Very specifically, the N, as in Nancy, 95 mask. Um, we have been able to source enough of those now that we can fully equip all of our first responders, first responders being EMS, fire rescue, and then our public safety folks, that being the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. Now, very specifically with respect to that, each person will have their own mask that cannot be shared. And also with respect to the sheriff's office, if they come in contact with anyone and they have to transport someone, we are going to sterilize that particular vehicle that was used for transport. That vehicle will be temporarily taken out of service until that process has cured within the car and there's a clearance and then that vehicle will be put back into service. With respect to the detention center, very specifically, we are not allowing any visitation except through internet visitation. So there will be no face-to-face -face interaction between, or even through the speaker interaction, it will only be um, electronic interaction. So these are measures that are being taken very specifically to try to prevent the spread of disease. Um, additionally, in terms of any permits for metal that are issued by the sheriff's office within their lobby, that is not gonna be allowed. Any fingerprinting that's required for application screening, that is gonna be temporarily suspended. And so also special event alcohol sales permits. We don't want people to assemble, so therefore those permits will not be issued. All of those items will be mentioned in our correspondence that our public information officer is putting out on our website. So if uh, folks go to our website, they're able to receive that information at dorchestercountysc.gov slash uh, coronavirus. So therefore, any information that a person, I'm sorry, it's on the homepage. Right. So therefore that information is available. It gives uh, instructions on what folks are to do at work, what they are to do at home, um, it gives very specific information relative to vulnerable populations. A lot of people have been focusing on those that are a part of our elderly population, mm -hmm. but also those that have heart disease, those that have respiratory disease, those that have diabetes, and those that have compromised immune systems. All of those folks are in vulnerable populations, so we've been in contact with the senior centers. We've been in contact with the uh, food pantries. And so through that coordination, we are working with them to try to ensure that those vulnerable populations will not have congregate meals and alternatives are being put in place to make sure that folks that typically come to the senior centers for congregate meals will now be fed through alternative methods. Mm. Excellent. Thank you for the, for the thorough uh, explanation, Mr. Ward. Uh, one other question, if I may, in, in regards to that. With the emergency decoration that we've just approved, does that give the county additional authority in the event of an outbreak, specifically speaking towards um, saying the community 65 or older be placed on lockdown if there was an outbreak in that area or something like that, or as far as the emergency declaration rights, as pursuant to the county, what we just declared as far as extending their authority? No, sir, it does not. Okay. And I, I want to make one correction. The uh, website is uh, dorchestercountysc.gov slash r-county slash COVID-19. Okay. 
If you go to dorchestercountysc.gov, you'll be directed to the page. Once, so, and I'll provide one additional thing. Um, once we go to operating condition two, which means partial activation of our ELC, our county website, dorchestercountysc.gov, will have the information there without clicking to an additional page. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Any other questions? All right, Mr. Ward. Well, Mr. Barr, excuse me, sir. I just heard you just shut down the Capitol. Yeah. How, how long is this for? It's the 13th of April. Or unless Magic council takes action yeah. to end that prior to the 13th. But, Mr. Hunter, if you lose money, you can get paid. That's, that's, that was a million dollars for. You personally? Are you, you paying me personally? <laughs> I'm kidding. No, it's not. It, it, and honestly, it just just speaking very selfishly and practically, it's not it's not necessarily that. It's just that you know we have we're committed. Mr. Frampton understands this from his past life. We're committed and scheduled to have some uh, uh, closings. We will have to notify folks because that that will not happen under these circumstances. That's. That'll be it. that's an interesting ripple. I mean, it's it's foreseen, but it's just I, and I'm not I'm not objecting. Just wow. Okay. I, I I was thinking about the front, and then I said, oh wait, that's the records room as well. So, but you you can have records pulled, correct? If you notify, it doesn't work like that in the real world. No respect. No, Only you're asking you're years. asking title search. Do, right, right. I, I don't think you're committing the. No, we're not. We're not committing that. to do title research. No, 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 no. This is, and, and again, not not to get into the details of this, but you know, generally the county online, we can go back about 28 years, more or less. Hmm. We need 40. So just just know, by the way, I'll old school 60. I'll search those 12 years for you. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> Money. <laughs> Thank you. Do do appreciate that. And and what I'll say, um, Councilman Hearn, <laughs> Councilman Byers, others, there are specific concerns that are raised um, with us having to have our staff within the office. We want to make sure we try to react to those, and to the extent possible, uh, provide the service required. Certainly. Don't. And and again, I I like I said, I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't understand. Did the exact same thing today. And I, I, I've got to ask because I don't know Bill's side of it, so I'm slightly ignorant on ROD information. I mean, I know the other side, and I know what's sitting out there with closings on purchases and pipelines and people that have moving trucks scheduled, and um, we're basically putting a lot of self-employed people out of business with this temporarily, which we knew was coming anyway. It's just quicker than I anticipated, and then two, potentially in the short term, some families that may be on the way here with trucks to move into something. Um, and I'm trying to figure out, is there a way to bridge that intermediate gap? Um, well, I'll say two things. Um, and I didn't mention this earlier because uh, on the sake of time, uh, what we've done internally that I think is vitally important to understand is we are really discouraging people in terms of traveling outside of this area. Right. And anytime we bring in people from outside of the area, it can be as close as the Midlands where they've had a real outbreak. We are exposing our community to the potential of spread of the virus. I understand. And so in a preponderance of caution, um, we really would discourage travel into the county for that purpose, even for those that are looking to relocate here. Um, and it's not just people coming. I mean, you got people moving from Legend Oaks to Westcott. I mean, you, you got people that are locked in on an interest rate that would lose that rate, and that's money. That's real money that we're talking about. So I'm just trying to see, is there, that's a pretty heavy decision, you know, I mean, and, and, and understand that's, that's not a personal one for me. I mean, I'm just thinking about there's thousands of people that that's going to financially affect. 
um, throughout the Tri-County. Um, Mr. Ward, if I, if I may go back, circling back, it, it's come, you made a mention of the, the, the vulnerable, the elderly population, and, and that, does that apply as far as meals and so forth, getting those to just those folks registered, or would that be, how would others that are in that age bracket that are vulnerable um, yes. get meals? Or do we have something in place? And does the emergency decoration allow Mario to then put some of these mitigation processes in place as well? So two things. Um, we, we, one, um, we are in contact with the nonprofit community and those folks that are typically volunteers or are active during disasters. Um, our point of contact in that particular situation is our deputy director of emergency management, and uh, that is Matt McNamara. So um, again, we are in direct contact with them to try to provide these services. If a citizen has a particular need, Mm -hmm. And one, I would first say they should go through the traditional channels like Meals on Wheels. We will work with Meals on Wheels, and I'm naming them in particular because they are the service um, that we utilize to assist seniors mm -hmm. with meals. Two types of meals, and I'll, I'll be clear. Congregate meals were the meals where seniors were coming again to our senior centers. Right. And then home delivery. So what we're trying to do at this point is supplement their services for home delivery. Because in many cases, you had able-bodied seniors that were delivering to seniors. Right. And so what we're now doing is we are identifying folks that will be able to assist in that capacity. With that, as far as the identification of those folks and those volunteers that you mentioned, are we in a posture to set up a screening for those people to make sure that they aren't infected carrying those meals to say so, elderly? So what I'm, what I'm first gonna say again, and I, I'm gonna apologize, but I think this is vitally important. Um, in terms of what the screening processes are, mm -hmm. uh, local hospitals are handling that process through telemedicine and referral. Okay. And I think it's vital to say that. Sure. Um, there are still a limited number of tests available, and that has to be the process. This is not gonna be a situation where we can just do mass screenings for the general public. Okay. And so unless a person is indicating that they are exhibiting the symptoms, which therefore then would be at the point where they would need to go through the process of, again, answering the questions, whether that's answering the questions if they're needing to call 911 and our dispatchers take them through a protocol that was implemented literally today, mm -hmm. um, or whether they need to go through a process of screening through telemedicine, whether that's through one of the local hospitals um, or the medical university that released information on how to do that, which is also on our website, right. then uh, we know we're not going to be doing specific screenings for people doing home delivery meals unless they are indicating that they have a situation where they are feeling sick, exhibiting the signs of the virus. 10-4. And, and, and just so I'm clear, if in the event we were to get to that level, is Mario and emergency management planning and preparing should we need to move to that type of screening and community overlay. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this again and I'm gonna apologize. Uh -huh. DHEC is the lead agency right. within the state with respect to that. The okay. guidance that we're receiving, the resources that will be received will be coordinated through DHEC. So those decisions will be made and guidance will come down through DHEC and we will continue to follow that guidance. It's not a situation where I can make that decision sure. or Mario can make that decision because gotcha. we don't I was have just, the resources to, to do those types of screens. Fair enough. I, and I was just trying to understand if the emergency declaration gave him that authority. It, but is DHEC also responsible for the counties, every single county? I every single county, South, South every Carolina. single county has a DHEC location. Our DHEC location in terms of the health department is actually located on this complex right. adjacent to this chamber. So yes, sir. Um, we are in very close contact with the Awesome. Thanks, sir. I appreciate the detail Let me ask and the you. hard work. Thank you. I'm going to follow up on what something Bill asked. Okay. Yeah. There's a loan in pro there's a, there's a deal in process right now and the lawyer has got to get title insurance. 
He hadn't got it yet, but he ordered it today. I got. I'm the more. I'm. A, I'm mortgaging the property. I'm, yes, sir. I'm buying, holding the mortgage on it. Yes, sir. Is this lawyer going to? The, the purchaser picked out the lawyer. Is they going to be able to get a title insurance done? Well, that, you want me to answer that? Yeah, answer. It's George, Mr. Chairman. It's going to depend on if they've already done the search. There's, there are a couple of factors. I was talking to Mr. Byers about this, not to get way into this, but. It, it depends on the nature of the transaction. If you you own the property, no, I'm I'm just mortgaging mortgage, it, uh, seller to a buyer. Wow, it, it's really going to depend on the last transaction who did it. There's some ways to try to you can bridge title policies. There's things that you can do. This will not affect all real estate transactions, but by gosh, it will affect some for sure. Um, don't it, if you if you get more information, you. Know, can answer that question. It, I hate to say it, it depends on the circumstances. It really does. Each one will be a little bit different. Um, Mr. Ward, do we know if Berkeley and Charleston are implementing the same thing? Is this so? Charleston County has already um, gone to OpCon too. The okay. City of North Charleston has done that. The city okay. of Charleston has done that. Town of Mount Pleasant has done that. They did that it's earlier coming. today. It's coming. So, okay. um, thank you. We are not out on a, a limb by ourselves, sir. Mr. Ward, it, I'm sorry, if I may. A couple, a couple other questions, just real quick. For the, for the DHEC side, real quick, that obviously the medical. For the civic side, like the, just take for example, Mr. Hearn's example there. Could we set up a checkpoint for folks to come in and do the necessary, the screening and so forth on the civil side? Versus the medical. I understand the medical. I understand completely what I, you're saying. I want to first understand what you're describing as the civil side. Right. So, you know, s civil order, right, as far as the daily business operations, right, it, it, specifically for, I'll use the same example there, for getting in the records room, right? Could there be a screening process set up in order to allow folks, are we just shutting that down with not even that option? So I, I'll, I'll provide this information and um, I, I will take some notes to, to follow up on your concern. But I, I really like to be clear that unless those resources are going to be provided by the state, which we can request resources from mm -hmm. the state, we as a county, and to my knowledge, no other county in the state is prepared to screen folks, um, mm -hmm. we'd be asking to do a couple of things that really are against the spirit of not assembling. Yes. And so I want to first say that, um, where we'd basically be bringing together people. Um, one of the reasons why the telemedicine choice was made mm -hmm. is to try to minimize the amount of exposure for medical professionals, okay? okay. So that's why, um, first and foremost, with a limited amount of personal protective equipment, what you want to do is <coughs> vet calls coming into dispatch. That's number one. Vet calls going in to telemedicine through the hospitals. And then based upon a series of questions to determine whether this person is genuinely exhibiting the symptoms that would indicate that they are probably positive for the coronavirus, then you refer there, there is there's no situation where any doctor's offices, hospitals, our county EMS can take every citizen that is interested in a test, regardless of whether they're showing signs of being positive through a test. Uh, again, one of the reasons why we've changed our protocol is, um, without getting in the weeds, um, typically when we have a response, by EMS. EMS is not the only responder. Often they are accompanied by public mm -hmm. safety and fire rescue. Mm -hmm. We've changed our protocol for that so that we can ensure that EMS does respond and they do have the necessary personal protective equipment. They do have the ability to make sure they are able to provide care. But at the same time, we don't want to expose other personnel are the general public in situations where they do not have that equipment to be protected when the best measure we have is to keep people apart. 
Correct. And that's it the best way the to curve. prevent. Yes, Absolutely. Sir. And so that is the reason why I'm not, not trying to be vague with any of my answers. No, I sure. I appear to be redundant, but we are very strictly trying to follow the guidance that we've been given by CDC. Sure. And DHEC. Um, it, literally hourly, uh, we're getting additional information and we're trying to provide that information through updates to the public um, and changing the way that we're doing business to try to protect the general public by being there for them in their time of need. Absolutely. Thank right, you. Gentlemen, we're going to go back to the gender. Sorry Thank for you. that, Swart. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Ward, 5A, sir. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, the only item I have for your consideration on the agenda is third reading of an ordinance to amend Dorchester County Zoning and Land Development Standards Ordinance Number 0413 as previously amended. To add new Article 7, Section 7.4.10, minimum open space requirement, and new Section 7.5.11, minimum open space requirement, and to add new Article 8, Section 8.2.9, minimum open space requirement, to amend Article 21.13, oversized and offsite improvements. Also, with respect to Article 25, to add a definition for, pedest for pedestrian infrastructure, with the purpose of this amendment being to create standards for open space and off-site infrastructure improvements to include but not be limited to right-of-way with stormwater management and pedestrian connections to properly manage medium and higher density developments when the additional impacts of such developments would make existing infrastructure inadequate to serve such developments. The Planning Commission did meet on the 12th. Uh, they made a recommendation to amend uh, the ordinance as presented at second reading. Uh, Ms. Reinertson is here, who's our Planning and Zoning Director, and I would like for her to go through that <laughs> recommendation from the Planning Commission, which was a unanimous recommendation. Yes, sir. Planning Commission, when they reviewed this at the meeting last week, they did recommend approval with one text amendment that had to do with the language related to the open space component. So what uh, Planning Commission did was for sections 7.4.10, 7.5.11, and 8.2.9, <coughs> the minimum open space requirements. You'll notice under each of those there is an active open space component. What Planning Commission did was add a, another sentence at the end of the active open space requirement saying that the active open space requirement may be waived uh, if the development is adjacent to a public park and or is required to provide public pedestrians to a public park. This only deals with the active space component. So within your neighborhood, you would still have to provide open space, but you wouldn't have to necessarily improve it with a playground or other active component if you were providing a connection to a park that had that active space component. So that's the only amendment that came out of Planning Commission was just that waiver related to active space when you were adjacent to a park and connecting to it. Um, there was another question that came about uh, related to the off-site infrastructure portion of the text, section 21.13c, again related to connectivity for public schools and parks and a question whether that five foot sidewalk should be increased to a 10 foot multi-use path. If it is the desire of council to move forward in that direction, um, I would suggest adding a sentence on at the end of that second bullet. So with, within section 21.13C, you have the five foot sidewalk requirement, you have bullet related to commercial and employment centers, and then you have a bullet related to public schools and parks. I would suggest adding a sentence at the end that just states where feasible and appropriate, this requirement may be increased to a 10-foot paved multi-use path. So moved. Second. second. <laughs> yeah. Got a motion on the floor and a second. Any questions? All in favor? Is this, let me, Wait. I just need a clarification. All right. All right. That, that, was that motion only to make the alteration to the to the one section or was it to all of it for now the one section although okay. i'm not That's... yeah yeah I'm, I, I'm not necessarily proposing that we do a 10-foot biker or multi-use path to commercial infrastructure that may or may not make sense but if you're within a half mile 
of a school or a park, it makes a lot of sense for me to do a 10 foot wide multi-use path. I just path. wanted to make sure we weren't talking about open space in here because I still. Right, I've still got a question about that one as well. Um, so yes. Any other questions? N N N do, do we, we need to amend it. And whatever the particular is is being amended. I understand. Okay. I rescind my motion. We're, we're consistent tonight. <laughs> I'm just following Bill's lead. Mr. Hodge, <laughs> would you like to amend? All right, wait a minute. Just, that just in terms of a point of clarification, I just, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Your motion is to amend section 21.13C. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And the second bullet point about public schools and parks being located within a half mile radius. The language at the top says that we'll be putting in a five foot paved sidewalk connection. And I think for that to actually be a little bit more usable and user friendly, it needs to be a 10 foot wide multi use path so that people can bike with their kids to the park and to school because they're not going to do that on a five foot wide sidewalk. Okay. All right. All right, start all over. Uh, Mr. Byers, do you have an amendment? Uh, or Mr. Bailey, I'd move to amend the agenda to re reflect the language that uh, Kira had just proposed to us regarding a 10-foot wide multi-use path on the public schools and parks connection. Do we have a second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Now, uh, back to the, uh, the title and the amendment for approval as amended. And, I, and Mr. Chairman, if I might. Go ahead. On the open space before we approve everything. So I, I have a little bit of a concern on the open space only because of the way I read it. Okay. And, and I guess I, what I don't want is a future, and, and I realize there's one word that's very important, but I wonder if we can't add a few more words and make sure that's okay. clarified. So what, and, and that's the difference in the definitions between open space and active open space. Yes. So the active is certainly the difference. And I, I wonder if it would not be a, a little bit clarification in into the future for that last line to say the 25 percent active open space requirement may be waived if the development is adjacent to a public park and or is required to provide pedestrian connections to public park however the 30 percent open space requirement is still in place i, I just want to make sure that nobody confuses that that just because we're waiving that 25 percent active that they're getting a, a break on the other 30 percent that 30 because i asked i mean obviously mr ward i asked that question you clarified it but i mean we yep. read these things all the time and i think if we just clarify that with that some something saying that the the it, it doesn't provide relief from the th minimum open yeah, it, does, space it doesn't requ just the require active relief component. that's perfect it doesn't require relief to the so i would move to amend Seven four ten seven five eleven and eight two nine to include the language. Um, the waiver does not um, provide relief to the open space requirement. Uh, language, guys. I, I mean, thirty percent. Yeah, does does not. Right. Yeah, I just again, I maybe I'm overkilling that, but you made a motion. That my motion is to amend each of those to require the addition of the line that says the waiver do, does not provide relief for the minimum 30% open space requirement. Yeah. I'm going to second Mr. Chennis's really wordy amendment. That's a motion <laughs> on the floor and a second, and a second amendment. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Uh -huh. Do we have any more amendments? Mr. Hearn, would you like to make an amendment, sir? I think I'm good, sir. Thank I you for asking. Anybody else? <laughs> Are we so, in order, John? We're back to the main order. motion uh, to amend uh, Dorchester County Zoning and Land Development Standards with the amendment as amended. All in favor? Six to nothing. We got uh, good. Seven. Seven. Six, seven. Harry, yeah. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. I'm here. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chin, uh, oh, Ward and Sue have met earlier today, and we recommend a second reading of an ordinance to amend the codes of ordinance Dorchester County, South Carolina, to amend Chapter 44 Utilities, Article 3, Ward and Sewer Services, Division 23, Section 44-206, and Section 44-207. It was unanimously passed. 
You've heard the report of committee? All in favor? Aye. It is, it is unanimous. Thank you so I much. I heard her. Got her. Mr. Chen, do you have an appointment? Mr. Chairman, um, I, I guess the, the first comment I'd like to do is I'd like to thank um, Mr. John Groover for his lengthy service to the Dorchester County Planning Commission. Um, he's, he's been there for a long time um, and, and worked with that commission for quite some time. Um, at this time, I would like to appoint Mr. Mike Mercer to replace Mr. John Groover on the Dorchester County Planning Commission. Mike had been my appointee to the BZA for quite some time and, and from reports I got had done a, an outstanding job and I'm hoping he will bring that same energy and zeal to the Planning Commission. Second. Second. Motion to floor and a second. Any, uh, any questions? All in favor? Uh. Seven. Uh, thank you, Ms. Harrod. Mr. Chairman, I was going to say. Um, any other? I, I think I did. I think I actually appointed Mr. Groover, uh, <laughs> reappointed him. Mr. Murphy reappointed him, reappointed him, I as did you. Him. So I think he had been there probably 20 years. A long time. Yeah, about 22 years, possibly. A long so. time. Tracy may be able to tell me. <laughs> but yes, I, I, I may be wrong, but I think I'm right about it. Been that. there a while. And, and while she's checking, Mr. Chairman, I have a, another appointment. I'd like to reappoint Ms. Teresa McKnight to the Grievance Committee. Second. Is Thank you. A floor and a second. Any questions? All in favor? Uh -huh. Seven nut. And Mr. Uh, any, any other appointments to board a commission? Mr. Hearn, I'm glad we got off the CTC on DCTA. <laughs> You're never going to let me live that one down, are you? <laughs> Mr. Raptor, you up next. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The first item I have for your consideration is a resolution uh, to amend the existing multi-county park agreement with Orangeburg County to enlarge its boundaries for property in Orangeburg County uh, owned or operated by J. Jalaram Hotels Group, Inc., uh, to add property in a neighboring county that is Orangeburg County to our park. Council must adopt a resolution. I would request that the resolution be adopted. So moved. Second. The motion on floor and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. Seven to nothing. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Similarly, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of council, another resolution authorizing an amendment to our multi-county park ordinance with Orangeburg County to include property uh, of Orangeburg South Solar Project, LLC. Appreciate adoption of the resolution. So moved. Approved. Second. Motion on the floor and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Seven to nothing. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate Council's consideration of going into executive session to discuss uh, four contractual matters, as first being Dorchester County Transportation Authority overhead allocation, secondly being the potential purchase of real estate for conservation, uh, third item, fire service agreements with certain municipalities of the county, fourth, strategic planning for application proof of concept, and lastly, a personnel matter regarding administrative uh, restructuring. So moved. Second. Is the motion on the floor and a second? Any discussion? All in favor? Um, Seven nut. All right, gentlemen, let's go into executive session. We don't have anybody to talk to now. David? <laughs> <laughs> Unknown oh participant God. is now exiting. <laughs> okay. No. What happened?
Hello? Hello? My staff is We're still here. We can do equity funds, which that doesn't help you. We can do the most refinance, that does help you. We can do searches out of the neighborhood.
Hello? Hey, Who is this? Miss Harriet? Yes. Who is this? Okay. I'd like a large pepperoni with uh, extra cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I get that to y'all right away. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, executive session, council discussed the previously announced items, but no action was taken. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Hearn. Thank you, sir. I would move that county council authorize the county administrator to execute the fire protection services agreements between Dorchester County and the town of Ridgeville, the town of Harleyville, and the town of St. George. Do I have a second? Second. second. There's a motion on the floor and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Seven. Any other motion? Mr. Chairman, I have a move. Mr. Morgan. I would move that County Council authorize an annual overhead allocation transfer to the general fund from the one cent sales tax fund on a recurring basis each fiscal year until the sunset of the current transportation sales tax in the amount of 2.03%. We have a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Hot said none. Any other motions? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Crosby. Yes, sir. I would move that County Council approve the purchase of the Invisio cloud based application for strategic planning and transparency. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, motion to adjourn? No, that's all. I'm just joking. Hold on. Hold no, on. Go ahead. One more. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would move that County Council establish a new position titled Assistant County Administrator for Community Services, Grade 324, and establish a new position titled Director of Consolidated Dispatch, Grade 319. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any other motions? Now, Mr. Ms. Chairman. Yes. Mr. Chairman, our motion will adjourn. <laughs> motion on the floor. Second. Second. Have a second. second. All in favor? <laughs> uh, we adjourn. All right. All right. I'll All get that to pizza to y'all later. Everybody go home and good night, Harriet. Good night. Good night. Y'all be safe. You too. Did you see the video? I think it's the biggest one here.